Today I'm talking about the first chapter of Whitewashing Race, the myth of a colorblind society. The book was published in 2005 by a team of authors. The primary author is Michael K. Brown, a research professor of politics at the University of California, Santa Cruz. The publisher of this book is the University of California Press, so the intended audience is an academic one. The point of this chapter is to show how white people define racism determines how that something will be perceived, and therefore how it is treated. Our current definitions make racism a purposeful act of bigotry, perpetrated by an individual organization. An early part of the chapter disproves theories that argue that racism is a thing of the past and is perpetrated only by individuals intentionally. Brown et al. refers to those who subscribe to this theory as racial realists several times throughout the chapter. However, it's more than just a select few who believe that racism is a thing of the past. It is far more systemic than that. One of the examples that Brown et al. gives is when court cases involve discrimination. The law is biased towards white people being innocent. Victims need to prove intent rather than outcome. This is intentionally difficult to prove, which is made more obvious when cases of age discrimination come up. Theoretically, those cases should involve the same process, but often don't. Realities of racism. Evidence does still show that racism is very much alive, if you know how to look for it, because people won't say they support racist practices, but that only means that the language has evolved to something far more coded. One of the examples that Brown et al. uses to portray modern racism is housing, in particular how the levels of segregation have not changed. Brown et al. propose a new definition of racism, one that takes group position into account. Group position being all the places where and when it's better to be white and how the system seeks to pervert, preserve that, that privilege. The examples that Brown et al. used are mortgages. Blacks are likely to be, denied, to be denied than whites. Car sales, they tend to pay higher rates. Healthcare, blacks face having their problems largely ignored until it's too late. Sports, top tier coaches or managers are mainly white men because black athletes need to be superstars to play, but most coaches or managers were just average players. Law firms, as they also tend towards a superstar requirement for black applicants. Group position to systemic racism. So how do we get from white privilege to systemic race subjugation? According to Brown et al., when it involves a resource that is finite, and all resources are, resources are finite, Particularly with affirmative action in education, white Americans become convinced that they are losing something or facing hardship when they no longer get special or preferential treatment. This perceived loss is also where group status comes into play. Whites will do a lot to protect that, and because they are the majority, they are favored by the law and other systems. Brown et al. argue that people shouldn't worry about getting less education, but rather that exclusion of people of color from any institution will limit economic growth and create conflict. Racist versus non-racist. On page 54, Brown et al. poses the question, how different are racists from non-racists? The answer is not a positive one. It's mostly a difference in language only. They point out that we've seen plenty of examples of so-called non-racists in politics who are actually racist. That, in fact, it's the non-racists who propose the bills that negatively affect people of color. How the law protects systems of racism. Group position turns into systemic racism in part because the law sees racism as individual bigotry. The other part is when individuals or organizations try to address racial inequalities that get struck down by courts pretty regularly. The logic behind that is because in order to address racial inequalities, the actions must classify people by race. Brown et al. then asks, so how did that happen? Because the change it would take to address systemic racism is too big and too scary. There is too much for whites to lose. Society would rather look at racism as something in the past. By only addressing the past face of racism, we also feel better about ourselves, about how far we've come. Brown et al. argue that there is no place for colorblindness that continuing to practice colorblindness achieves nothing except to obstruct any efforts to challenge racism. They argue that the best ways to begin addressing racism is how it is to change how it is de defined. It should be made more complex to include more people and actions. We can't treat racist acts as exceptions. That way of thinking ignores other subtler forms like white privilege.
my criticism. My major criticism for this reading was that there was no, little to no discussion of class, except when they talked about higher education being a place that taught coded language. Historically speaking, class does play an important role in race relations. It was a tool utilized by the elite to keep poor whites and poor blacks from joining together. From PBS Online, 1998. It was also important in the discussion on privilege, because many poor whites believe that privilege is in relation to power or money, that they don't have privilege because they are poor, and that is a topic that sorely needs to be addressed. The most important quote that stood out to me uh, was by Robert Muth. Whites prefer and are willing to pay more for segregation than, than blacks are willing or able to pay for integrated, integration, as cited in Brown et al., 2005, page 53. This stood out to me from everything else because this quote is what everything else boils down to. The system has been created in such a way that to do anything outside of the status quo costs too much. I think this is the reason that Brown et al. are right when they talk about needing to change the definition of racism to include more people. Some of the questions that came to mind while I was reading were, were how do we overcome discussions of class and race? And how do racial realists leave room for, in some instances, of prejudice and still not consider themselves or others racist? Questions for the class. As LIS professionals, how do we begin to change the definition of racism? What can we do? Since so many of us are white, how should we overcome our own privilege? How should we begin? Do we start with equitable or equal measures? As someone who works in a very white community, how do we get our white community members on board with changes? Thank you.